Our top stories today, of course, are about the coronavirus. And it's nice every now and then to be able to cover the news and not talk about the coronavirus. Today is not one of those days. It's Monday, June 29th, 2020. And we've had a lot of things happen over the weekend with the coronavirus, but we're actually genuinely in a new stage with things where we have to re-examine what is the nature of the lockdowns, what is the nature of the virus itself. So first, we go to msn.com for AFP. China puts half a million people in lockdown as Beijing fights new cluster. <sighs> so many cluster frick jokes I could make if YouTube allowed it. China imposed a strict lockdown on nearly half a million people in a province surrounding the capital to contain a fresh coronavirus cluster on Sunday as authorities warned the outbreak was still severe and complicated. And this is in contrast in the United States where we have two, uh, well, maybe it's not, maybe they have divergent messages there. I imagine the Communist Party of China is a little more unified than the Socialist Party of America. By the way, that's how we refer to the Democrats and Republicans now. It's the left and the right wing of the American Socialist Party. They're all socialists. The difference between them is going off a cliff at 70 miles an hour or 80 miles an hour. And here in the United States, we have the president and vice president going, we've flattened the curve. And then we have the Department of Health and Human Services saying, well, no, it, it, it's about to be too late to even try to contain this thing. And this is like what I've been saying from the beginning is you just, you know, appropriate precautions, let people set their own levels of risk. You treat this like any other disease. It's not particularly more deadly than the flu. I mean, and, and the numbers are still coming in on this. They're coming down because you're getting more people tested finally for antibodies. People who have gotten it and recovered who are completely asymptomatic are starting to show up in the statistics, which means that the mortality rate goes down. Whereas before you saw the deaths, we know they were over reported anyway. Guy with a gunshot wound because he tested positive with Corona is not listed as dying with Corona, but oh, check from Corona. Now we get more money for our hospitals. Now we get more and, and more fear mongering, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, maybe we have flattened the curve, you know, in a sense. Maybe, I mean, maybe there, there really was no curve to flatten. Remember, the original flatten the curve that's behind all of this, because this was the final justification for lockdowns and shutdowns and regulation. It wasn't, hey, we have to stop people from uh, getting the virus. That's going to happen eventually. It's, it's going to get out there. Most people aren't. But we have to slow down, slow down the course of the virus, which is eventually going to run through all of society so that the curve doesn't go up too high over this imaginary line where hospital beds are filled with critical care patients. We never really hit that. All the stories about that were nonsense. They were shutting down hospitals with elective surgeries being deferred. And so you had problems at hospitals, but it wasn't for being overwhelmed with coronavirus patients. You know, and again, you look at the numbers, nothing suggests that this is any worse than a funky off-season flu, except maybe in the nature of it spreading and the fear of it and the government response. So back to China, after China largely brought the virus under control, hundreds have been infected in Beijing and cases have emerged in neighboring Hebei province in recent weeks. Health officials said Sunday, is anybody going to be offended that I mispronounced Chinese provincial names? Hebei, 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 I, I don't know. Health officials said Sunday that Anxin County, about 150 kilometers, that's 90 miles for you imperial system plebs, from Beijing will be fully enclosed and controlled, the same strict measures imposed at the height of the pandemic in the city of Wuhan earlier this year. One, only one person from each family will be allowed to go out once a day to purchase necessities such as food and medicine, the county's epidemic prevention task force said to say, well, that's good. I mean, at least if, if only one person is going out, you, you the rest can stay home and that other person can bring the coronavirus back to them. They don't even have to go out to get sick. But, you know, I mean, this is, it's insane. I, I catch myself going, get sick. Now, one of the things we saw that was really funny in the headlines today is that the uh, CDC in the United States has 
added three new symptoms to the coronavirus, right? And you go, wait, wait a second, three new symptoms. Can you, can you guess, Jim, did you see this one? Can you guess what they are? Runny nose. Yeah, that, that was like that. I thought they had said that before. You know, runny nose, if you have a runny nose, it's an early sign. Uh, stomach upset. And diarrhea. Well, I had a little soft stool this morning. I probably have the Rona. I mean, did you see what they, they, they like? And I, I hate, I have to go back and tell this story real quick is I fell for it. We fell for it. My, my wife, myself, our driver at the time when we were touring, we, we, we were like, well, I guess we got it. You know, we thought we had it. And we we're like, well, we probably had it. We had a mild version and we're getting over it. And it's not a big deal. Or we were like, well, Remember when we all had that weird sinus infection in December? And this is like, you know, again, the deliberate confusion around this, sowing seeds of conspiracy. Well, rem remember when everybody had that weird flu in December? Maybe that, maybe the coronavirus came to America before that. So they have to keep changing things and make you afraid. So to Pittsburgh CBS now, gym patrons potentially exposed to coronavirus at Planet Fitness in West Virginia. Remember, I was telling you months ago that when they shut down gyms, we were headed for a meathead revolt. And we saw some of that, right? Man, I get to say I told you so again. We had gyms leading, and not people named Jim like Jim Free. We had gyms leading the civil disobedience against the shutdown, saying, like, we're coming here to be healthy. Yes, we're going to touch a lot of surfaces that other people are touching, and we're going to wash our hands. Oh my gosh. And we saw, yeah, Planet Fitness was, uh, you know, Planet Fitness, the gym for people who don't like to work out. I get it. Uh, I'm an anytime fitness member myself, fan of gold, love all the gyms out there, everybody using whatever it takes to be healthy. And we've seen an explosion in home workouts, but people got to go to the gym, you know, like, and, and I know what that's like. I got weights here at home. I'm okay. If I'm not traveling, you know, I don't need to do it. But if if I'm not if I'm not doing manual labor every day, right, then you know it's it's nice to be able to go to the gym, but it's not just hey, it's nice, it's essential to maintain full health for a lot of people. So now what they want you to be afraid of that. There is a general attempt here to suppress health in general. Now we've we've referred to this virus as less deadly than testifying against Hillary Clinton, less deadly than trying to spend a counterfeit $20 bill in Minneapolis, perhaps more appropriate here to make this point, less deadly than drinking the water in Flint, Michigan. Government doesn't care about your health. And when they're saying, hey, be afraid of gyms, I mean, I'm afraid of comment gym freedom for other reasons, but be afraid of going to the gym because you might get sick and die or you, you're, it's, it, it's almost worse because they can't get away with that lie anymore, right? You might become a carrier and you might infect someone who would die later. Do we have to apply this to the flu now? Is this just, and, and again, there is a, there is a fundamental shift in the human experience around this. There, there's a new normal and there's a new normal now, but even if we were to get over all of this somehow. And it, it really, it, it's kind of like the final phase of the Chinese finger trap of government, I hope. I hope it's the final phase. So anyway, to this Planet Fitness story, health officials are warning hundreds of people who went to a Planet Fitness in West Virginia that they may have been exposed to the coronavirus. The news comes after the Monongalia County Health Department says one client at the gym tested positive for COVID-19. Anyone at the Planet Fitness from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on June 24th is asked to quarantine at home and monitor any symptoms for two weeks. Health officials estimate that 205 people were at the gym within that span of time. Oh, my gosh. I'm... Ugh. And they're going to do... A, they're gonna have a third party cleaning crew come in and stand disinfect the facilities prior to reopening. 
And now, you know, like I said, even even for me as a, as a, a germaphobe, uh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of glad that there's this increased consciousness of of can, the contagion theory of, of of illness, right? Is that what they call? It? No, it's the germ theory of disease, and and just the way that that germs can be contagious. But already we're seeing negative consequences from people overreacting out of fear. Now, what is that overreaction and fear? It could be as little as, oh, I got to put a mask on. All right, I'm going to wear my mask in my car. And, you know, we saw that we saw that even here in Ashford last week. Jim and I were like at the gas station, people driving in and out wearing masks the whole time. You know, like, oh my God, you failed the big public IQ test. Now, just to be clear about my position on the mask, it, yeah, okay, you, you know, if you want to wear them around other people to say, hey, I might be a carrier, I'm protecting you, okay, fine. Understand that that's what you're doing. And there are times I'll do that just to put people at ease if I'm going to a certain store. And although now here in Arizona, you know, we were just talking about this before the show, right, Jim? It's optional, right, to wear a mask for, I mean, you've been to Wall, like, what? who's open? Corporate giants who are allowed to do business. These friends of government, right? Walmart, it's optional. Yeah. Home Depot, it's optional. Those are the, the stores that you, you, you've been to in the last week. And that's great. You know, people, like, if, if there was a business that said, you know, hey, before you come in here, please wear a mask. I would respect it. If I'm going and visiting someone's home and they say, please wear a mask, I would totally respect it. You want to love, level up your germophobia just that much. Hey, let's let's do this little polite effort to minimize our communication through droplets, right? So that overreaction out of fear in terms of disinfection is already having consequences in some places where the disinfecting agents are causing health problems. Shocking, right? But it's not just that. Like I see this even at, at, at the Planet Fitness. There's all this effort going into something that it shouldn't go. Now, I, you know, I do this all the time, even with myself. Like, hey, I'm building this. Could I be building that instead? Would that bring more value into my life? Is this a misallocation of my time and energy? You're never going to be perfect in that regard, right? You're never going to go, this is exactly what I need to be doing right now to maximize value in my life. Nothing could be better. You know, there's there's always room for improvement. But it is heartbreaking when you see this huge social fear response leading to massive misallocations of resources, of energy, of time, effort, all of these things that could be going to solving the homelessness problem in America, which, by the way, is about to get a lot bigger. You could be addressing police brutality, which is good. You know, people are, are putting some energy into that, finally, although it seems like a distraction from the ripoff of coronavirus. You could be... Just being politically engaged enough to come to the conclusion that government is a racket and every time Congress passes a bill, they're ripping you off. And the more you can do to remove your support from the system, the better. Like you could improve your life in so many other ways if you weren't engaged in this fear. And there's this whole other layer of stress and fear across society right now, anxiety. And we're, and, and a lot of this is. Can we can we go out now? Can we go out now? Can we go? And I don't mean leave the house because they never got the the lockdown really to that level. But can we make travel plans? Can we leave the state? And isn't it funny that this is how we have things broken down? This is where we see you can control movement as government in a crisis is on on government borders, on state borders. We see in Florida now. They are going to be checking license plates and asking for quarantine for anybody who comes into the state now. And I'm going, I don't know if I want to go to the Libertarian National Convention at this point. And this is my big personal uncertainty. 
because that's a big endeavor for not not big like i mean i get in my bus and we drive to florida we drive back but what what happens if one of the state like we have to drive through how many states i went so i try to do the math uh new mexico texas louisiana you're pulling up a map louisiana you go uh alabama and then you're in Flo mississippi florida right there's a lot what if what if any one of those states says hey when you come into our did i get them all yeah when you come into our state adam passes the geography test this morning yeah <laughs> yes uh so any one of those states could say hey when you come into our state you have to quarantine for two weeks and we're going to watch we're going to track you we're going to monitor you Am I and, and what if it's on the way back? Okay, so New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Mrs. Alabama, is it Mississippi? Wait, sorry, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, six states. I don't know if it's Alabama or Mississippi first. Oh, he's got to pull. Look at that. Mississippi, then Alabama. Um, yeah, okay. So, wait, on this route, we also passed through Arkansas. Thank you. Yeah, see, that's what I was thinking. Louisiana, because it's the boot. You go through part of it, and then you hit Arkansas. You don't get to go down to the – you're going through Houston. You go skip Arkansas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got Arkansas, too, seven states. What if all of them imposed a two-week lockdown when you come in while we're in Florida? And then we're stuck in Florida? Well, we're stuck in Florida for two weeks. Then we drive Alabama. to Alabama. <laughs> then we're stuck in Alabama for two weeks. Then we're stuck in Mississippi for two weeks. Then we're stuck in Arkansas for two weeks. Then Louisiana two weeks. Mm -hmm. Then Texas two. So you see, like, just the simple thing. I'm going to drive to Orlando and back. No big deal. Yeah. Now it's a big freaking deal. And it's a huge risk. Is it worth it for what this represents? If I can participate online, I don't know. Now that I think, of, like, <clears throat> if things, because we made these plans for Orlando, assuming that things were coming down in terms of the curve of tyranny that we had flattened the curve. I, I guess, in that sense, America really has failed to flatten the curve of tyranny. Some of the stories are you know, encouraging when you see sheriffs saying, no, we're not going to enforce anything. But then, you know, the, the, another just random story today, apparently there was a shopper somewhere shoved into a wall by a sheriff's deputy, like crazy viral video, for not wearing a mask. Just for not wearing a mask. That was, I'm sure there's way more to the story than that. But no, overall, has the curve of tyranny been flattened in America? Absolutely not. Now, back to the fear. We go to the Daily Mail keep moving moment lawyer couple brandish an ar-15 and handgun at protesters marching past their mansion in an upscale st louis neighborhood husband and wife mark and patricia mccloskey could be seen aiming the guns at demonstrators who walked by their palatial property in st louis on sunday cj can you can you pull the video up and just play without the audio while, while i get into the story a little bit more here now this this home is like when i first saw it i'm like are they in front of their I saw lawyers. I'm like, are they in front of like their fancy office building? It's like, no, that's their home. And, you know, good for them for being able to do that. And you look at this, like, giant brick. Now, uh, I love Maj Ture posted about this. And he said, you know, I, I could weigh in on this, but I want to hear from you. What do you see right and wrong in terms of gun safety? What do you see right and wrong in terms of, of tactics? What do you see right and wrong in terms of fashion? And yes, yeah, you look at this and you're like, whoa. Now, this is a protest going by on the street. And these people think that they have to, in their residential neighborhood, defend their home like this. Now, the first question is, do they actually have to? Like, are these protests and riots requiring people to protect their property and to be vigilant if they have? protests in the area yeah 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 like now 
Is this an appropriate response? Absolutely not, for a lot of reasons. First of all, gun safety. Yeah. Never point a weapon at anything you do not intend to shoot. And this muzzle, basic muzzle awareness. These people should be arrested for threat. Now, I don't know, should be arrested. I, I take that back. Should these people, no, no. But in, in a free society, there would still be serious consequences for someone who just, fla it's called flagging in the military. You know, fl is, this, is this a civilian term too? Flat, when you point a weapon, like, this is why you see people carrying rifles pointed down. They are angled towards the ground. So if you have, and it's, you, you have a, a weapon that will poke holes in human bodies. You take if you can take two or three precautions with that, you do. So you don't put a round in the chamber, first of all, at all, until you're ready to fire, right? Unless you have to walk around, you know, at the ready in a combat scenario, or or you're hunting, you have a round in the chambers, you can draw and fire. But if you're not in a situation where you anticipate drawing and fire, you don't have a round in the chamber. Um, you know, I mean, some people, and this is this is this is a little more controversial. Some people will say, no, Adam, if you're carrying. Like, I used to open carry a revolver. There's six rounds in six chambers. So I get it. Some people decide, hey, you know what? For my personal protection carry weapon, I'm going to keep a round in the chamber. But you know what? If you're good with a gun, you don't have to. And it's better not to if you if you have a pistol. Because, and, and this is, I've done the, the six or five day defensive handgun course at Front Sight in Vegas. Highly recommend it. You can draw and chamber and present and safety off within a second. There's no real need tactically to have a round in the chamber and a holstered weapon on your hip, okay? So what now, do I know the status of these weapons in the video? No, uh, but they're, they're, they're flagging, they're just like pointing them around, they're being threatening, that is a threat. To point a weapon at a person is, is and there's a legal term for it, it's called brandishing. They are brandishing these weapons. Highly irresponsible. So they could be seen aiming the guns at, at demonstrators. So, and, and it's, I love, this is so hilarious. At one point, the pair seemed to be unknowingly pointing their weapons at one another while trying to keep protesters away. You see that the husband with his rifle, with his AR horizontal, just turning around like going to the side. And he points it right at his wife's belly at one point, And you're like, these are people who, like, I don't want to say should not be allowed to own guns. They're on their own property. Need to be educated. Not, yeah, okay, need to be educated. Well, no, I, I go even further than that. Like, if you're living in a community like this where your property is, is butted up against other people, you're you're going to have some kind of special agreement or your land, your, your homes are th that close. These people should not be allowed to own guns in a community like that. Like, if I was organizing a community, I would say, no, if you do this with a gun, your, your gun rights are suspended. And it's not that your gun rights are suspended. It's your privilege of owning a gun in this communal property is suspended. Go buy your own land that you really own. And and then you can, uh, you know, then you, they're there when it's really your private property. There you have a right to, to own and brandish and do whatever irresponsible things you want with your firearms. Khakis, pink polo, horizontal stripes on a woman, uh, you know, they say the camera adds 20 pounds. Is it that or the top? Or is it just that she's hugely over, you know, irresponsible? See, like, I, I, when Maj Chere posted this with the questions, I was like, you know, he said, you know, firearms, safety, right, wrong, legal, right, wrong, fashion, right, wrong. And I was like, health and fitness, right, wrong. I mean, these, are, if you have time to responsibly own a firearm, right? I think, before, like, priorities, people. To responsibly own a firearm means going out, buying it, maintaining it, maintaining your skills. I mean, if you really want to be super responsible, you know, you go to the, the the firing range like once a month, make sure that you're still competent in doing it. You can't you can't put the same energy into maintaining your your health as your security. Now, tactically, what would be appropriate here? You stay inside. You have a loaded gun on the table. And you look out the window, right? Someone comes to your property, you run out, and you're responsive, defensive. You know, or I, but is that really, what's the, you know what the best defense in this situation is for these people? To stand out in front of their house 
with a sign that says, I support Black Lives Matter. Instead of, I'm white and I'm afraid and I'm going to point a gun at you. These people both happen to be personal injury lawyers. You think they would know better. All right. So there's more fear in the streets right now to get into from sfgate.com. Detroit police SUV plows through group of protesters, flings people who climbed on hood. Whoa. CJ, pull this up, please. Can we can we get the video on this? This is this is absolutely nuts. A largely peaceful protest in Detroit against systemic racism and police brutality turned violent on Sunday night as a police SUV plowed through a group of protesters, striking multiple people and sending a couple of demonstrators who had climbed on the hood flying from the vehicle. Police accelerated the vehicle multiple times as dozens of protesters surrounded the SUV, according to videos of the incident posted to social media. After each acceleration, protesters could be heard shrieking in shock, pleading for the driver to stop, putting their foot on the gas while people were in front of the vehicle and being thrown from the hood of the car. As a, according to one person who's there recording it, 10 to 12 people were hit. The extent of the injuries remain unclear, but multiple people were injured and receiving treatment at local hospitals. Now, some people have been critical. Now, Jim brought, brought us great footage from the first round of Black Lives Matter protests inspired by George Floyd uh, a few weeks ago now. And crazy footage of people attacking police cars. And at the time, a lot of America was going, how dare you destroy that? Pro well, that property is being used as a weapon, irresponsibly, unethically, to hurt and kill innocent people. And the footage you're looking at right now is actually not that unique except really in the quality of the footage and the directness of what this officer is doing. Because there have been multiple occasions in the last few weeks of similar incidents of police using their vehicles as weapons against protesters. So what does this tell you? Not just be afraid, be afraid to even speak out. To show up in the streets. And I know this might seem hyperbolic to say, oh, well, you have to be afraid to. Pro no, but if you've ever been to a protest with, with a significant crowd, and I've been to a lot, it's really easy to get pushed around. It's really easy to kind of get hurt into a crowd where you don't want to be. It's not like, hey, I'm going to walk this parade route. Everything's going to be safe. There's a starting rallying point and there's an end point. And then we're going to disperse. I'm just like any public event. No, especially right now, especially with anti-police brutality protests being met with more police brutality. But that's not enough. From the Daily Star, terror groups aiming to deploy coronavirus spreaders for new jihad attacks. According to anti-terror cops in Russia, sick jihad groups are encouraging new members to spread coronavirus in public places. So many problems with this headline. Remember, the Department of Health and Human Services Secretary here in the United States said that we are about to be beyond the verge of even controlling this thing. That we might as well just go for the herd of, well, he didn't say this, but the suggestion is that we might as well just go for herd immunity at this point. Get it out there. Like I said before, if, if, if it wasn't for the government right now and the restrictions on the medical industry, you could probably go into a doctor's office and say, give me the virus. I'm, I'm you know, and they check to make sure you're healthy, that your odds of death are 
you know, in the in the 0.001% category, which is most of us already. And they, they inject you with the virus in such a way that, you know, you it, it's it's not like a vaccine. It's like, but the to have the effect of a vaccine, remember a vaccine is, and somebody correct me if I'm getting the science wrong, but they give you like a piece of the virus and it's DNA in a safe form and they inject it in you so that your body creates the antibodies so that if you then get exposed to the complete virus organism later, you've already got the antibodies, you're essentially immune, right? Well, with this, it's like the virus itself isn't that bad. Just give it to me so that I can wor not ever worry about being a carrier ever again or getting it worse later. I mean, I, it, it, it's like chicken pox parties for kids. Get it while you're healthy. Because if this is a thing that's going around now, but it only kills elderly and immunocompromised and only at a rate of about the flu, then you want to get it while you're young and healthy. Now, don't. Don't take what I'm saying as medical advice, right? This I have not done the conclusive scientific examination. You should go get this. But I, I'm saying, like, if it's possible to do it safely, like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. And just my little Trump 40 chess strategy on this, he's secretly doing the herd immunity strategy by hosting rallies and making sure that his people are stronger than the Democrats, right? that the Republican wing of the Socialist Party has greater herd immunity than the Democrat wing of the Socialist Party. And so they get to go out with less fear in the future. If you say, well, I had it and I got over it. It wasn't that bad. Well, now you can go, I mean, you're, you're bulletproof. Remember, hypothetically, and this is always the caveat, I heard Dr. Fauci talking about this yesterday, and it's like, well, we don't know for sure, but the theory is if you get it and you get over it, you can't get it again. Remember there were these stories? They had to drop this. This was part of the narrative about corona like a month ago until maybe about a month ago. Jim, do you remember this? You, you could get sick and then get reinfected. Nah. Nah. This virus isn't that special. But if we can associate it with terrorism, we can make you afraid. Now, we go to LMT online for our next story via the Washington Post, Sarah Kaplan and Joel Achenbach. Coronavirus mutation has taken over the world. Scientists are trying to understand why. Man, we should have titled today's show, I Told You So. because And, and this is, again, we talked about this months ago, that the natural course of any flu-like virus is to mutate and over time get less deadly and more contagious, right? You think about it, it makes sense because survival reproduction, which virus is gonna survive and reproduce? The one that kills the hosts? No, the one that is less deadly, but more contagious. So that's the natural course when you see a new deadly virus appear, when that actually happens, whether this is qualifies as that, probably not. But anytime there's a new virus, the mutations over time tend to be to make it less deadly. But never mind the sensationalist headline, the mutation has taken over the coronavirus mutation has taken over the world. Oh, well, excuse me. I have yet to pledge fealty to my new coronavirus global overlord who has taken over the world uh, like Thanos. Really, scientists are trying to understand. And by the way, this is sensational headlines. Jim, did you see this one for our home state of Arizona? Even on Drudge Report. Coronavirus races through Arizona. Races? Against Ebola? Is it, is it, is it H1N1 versus Ebola versus coronavirus? And who can get through Arizona the fastest? And what? Like, you look, these... In and of it th themselves, these these weird distortionary headlines, the sensationalism, like reveals what the agenda is. What are they trying to do? When the first coronavirus cases in Chicago appeared in January, they bore the same genetic signatures as a germ that emerged in China weeks before. That doesn't say identical because it had already mutated some, right? That's we, we saw there's a chart somewhere of like all the different virus versions of Corona. And I what I predicted months ago was that there would be mutations. And then the mutations would be portrayed as new threats. 
they wouldn't be accurately presented as, oh yeah, this is what viruses do. They would be presented as, be afraid, be very afraid. So, but as Egon Ozer, an infectious disease specialist at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine examined the genetic structure of virus samples from local patients, he noticed something different. A change in the virus was appearing again and again. This mutation associated with outbreaks in Europe and New York eventually took over the city, but in by May, it was found in 90% of all the genomes Ozer sequenced. <clears throat> At a glance, the mutation seemed trivial. About 1,300 amino acids serve as building blocks for a protein on the surface of the virus. In the mutant virus, the genetic instructions for just one of those amino acids, number 614, switched to the new variant from a D, shorthand for aspartic acid, to a G, short for glycine. But the location was significant because the switch occurred in the part of the genome that codes for the all-important spike protein, the protein structure that gives the coronavirus its crown-like profile and allows it to enter humans, human cells the way a burglar picks a lock. And its ubiquity is undeniable. Of the approximately 50,000 genomes, the new virus researchers worldwide have uploaded and shared to a database, about 70% carry the mutation, officially designated D614G, but more familiarly to scientists as G. G hasn't just dominated the outbreak in Chicago, it has taken over the world. Well, if it's it's if it's 70%, that's that's the new normal of the virus, isn't it? But does it cause any difference in how it behaves or what it does? At least not yet, except probably making it less deadly. And what would be nice is, you know, as it mutates, it becomes less deadly, but people still get the antibodies that might prevent them from contracting a more contagious version. But that's what's fading out. That's how viral evolution works. So where is this going? What is the effect of this? Why is today's show titled The Fiscal Cliff? Well, remember when I talked about flattening the curve of tyranny, one of the possibilities that I projected is that it was just going to kind of, it was going to go up and then more or less continue flat. Now, I also predicted that it could come down in steps, right? And we've seen some of that. Here's what I didn't really predict in that, in that scenario where things stay flat. It steps down and steps up and steps down and steps up and reopening and reclosing. And this business can be open and that business can be open. And now they can and now they're closed and now they're shut down. And now you have to wear masks and now you don't. And here you do and there you don't. That's, so there's this like, it's, 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 a, it's not a jagged line of slopes. It's a, it's a series of steps up and down, up and down, up and down, but more or less continuous. And so it fits with that part of my prediction, at least, is that as long as government can keep, and the media and everybody else involved in the fear mongering can keep that level more or less. In fact, but they don't want to keep it level, right? Because if they kept it level, they say, okay, we're going to, here's the virus, here's the response, here's the lockdowns, here's the shutdowns, here's the economic manipulation, and it's flat, here it is, here's the new normal. People can fight that. People can adapt. People can make plans economically, logistically, travel plans, right? Business plans, employment plans, living plans. They can not do that when that line is fluctuating all the time. What about this? What about that? And all they have to do, and this goes to my prediction about the mutation, is that they were just going to use it either to, to ratchet up the fear or to be able to maintain the exploitation. And that's what happens. So what's the effect already? I mean, we've been talking about this for months now since Trump declared the national state of emergency, which is that there's there's a fiscal cliff coming. And, and it's in, in a way, we already fell off one. And that's the forced unemployment crisis. That's the, the artificial government-induced fiscal cliff where we saw unemployment skyrocket to the tens of millions of claims more people than that suffering economically out of work and that's really 
just the start of the economic crisis. That government-induced forced unemployment phenomenon is leading to another fiscal cliff. And that's the wave of evictions coming. But first, let's talk about food. From ZeroHedge.com, food bank lines reemerge as COVID paralyzes households. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began, food bank lines stretching for miles were seen across the United States have come to symbolize the financial destruction of households triggered by an abrupt closing of businesses and unprecedented job losses. Tens of millions of people lost their jobs and a million more turned to food banks. The demand for food pantries was at record levels as the federal government deployed the National Guard to manage food supply chains to thwart disruptions. In March, April, and May, food bank systems nationwide reported unprecedented demands as millions of hungry, jobless, and broke Americans with insurmountable debts and no savings had no meaningful way of putting food on their tables. To be more specific, food security among households in San Antonio, Texas, was a huge issue resulting in more than 23 million pounds of food serving 240,000 cars at drive through distribution and 5,800 home visits was seen at the San Antonio Food Bank over the three months. During the period, retail sales bounced modestly after a stunning record decline, mostly because a quarter of all personal income was derived from the government. Essentially, what this means is that the Trump administration activated the money helicopters to avoid a total collapse of the U.S. economy via unemployment and emergency benefits, welfare checks, and so on. But, and this is from Hayek and Keynes, the long view on Twitter, quoted at Zero Hedge, retail sales bounced back like a rubber band because of stimulus, Trump checks, PPE, UE bonuses. It's all over in a few weeks. And with the new uptick, we likely see at least six more weeks of contraction with no plug. The real hit starts now. Now, you don't need a plug. You need to withdraw the suffering creating this in the first place. Now, if you can't afford food, guess what? You probably can't afford rent. And one of the problems with government getting involved in the housing industry, same as with the education industry, is that prices have gone up artificially. You look at the cost of tuition. What happens when, well, we have to make sure that everybody gets college loans. Well, nobody works their way through college anymore. Colleges are able to charge as much as people will be able to get in their loans. Tuition goes way up, and then you end up graduating with insurmountable debt. Now, of course, that's all going to get wiped out with the dollar collapse. But until then, that debt has real consequences. And with housing, it's the same thing. The price of housing has gone up unrealistically because of government intervention. We need to make sure that everybody has a home. Well, when government does that, what's the opposite is the effect. And now we have a situation where we have more empty homes than we have homeless people in America. And we're about to have a lot more homeless people. And part of this is because that rise in uh, housing costs has led to a rise in rental costs, even more so than that. And what that means is that people who are poor, who tend to be renters more than homeowners, <clears throat> are paying more of their income on rent proportionately. And they lose their income. They're paying food. Now, we've heard that there's been a moratorium on evictions in a lot of places, right? That's great. Hey, you can't evict people because the government said so. Well, now, what is the effect of that? More force, right? You own a home, you're renting it to or you own an apartment, you're renting it to people. Doesn't matter if that renter is now destroying your property, say, right? You can't evict them. You are forced to keep all of your tenants, even if that relationship shouldn't exist. So now a natural way of 
there being turnover, good people and bad people finding better housing situations, frozen. What's that effect going to have? Or what effect is that going to have? How about construction? Is anybody going to be, by the way, that, remember, Jim, we covered, wasn't it last week? Now construction is being shut down. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the lockdowns, they said that construction was considered essential. Because, you know, dudes on a construction site, you can maintain distancing. Well, somehow they found an excuse we can shut down the construction industry now. Now, what we had with these in, in moratoriums on evictions did not include moratoriums on rent payments, which means that if you didn't make your rent but didn't get evicted, as soon as the moratorium is lifted, you're done. And the moratorium was just in, in most places on going through with the evictions. Landlords all over the country have still been filing legal eviction notices for people not paying rent. So we go now to Reuters for a cash cliff spells trouble for U.S. unemployed and everyone else. Judith Ramirez is bracing for July. That's when the hotel housekeeper and her electrician husband who have both been out of work for three months, expect their combined unemployment benefits to drop by more than half and their deferred $1,500 monthly mortgage payment on their Honolulu home to come due. Now, is, now owners, they're not really owners. They're, you know, I mean, they're, they're, it's kind of like rent to own. Really, that's what a mortgage is. You don't really own that home. The bank owns that home. I mean, until you maybe you've paid off the majority of it and they say, well, you have majority equity in the home. You're a, if, if you own less, you're a minority stakeholder in that property. And you pay rent to buy ch- and buy chunks of it as you go paying a mortgage. And it's just as bad. Well, I shouldn't say just as bad. But the wave of evictions is going to hit homeowners also. It's a cash cliff millions of Americans face this summer as the emergency benefits, which lifted U.S. consumer incomes by a record 10.8% in April, expired. The loss of that safety net looms in the weeks ahead well before a sustained recovery is likely to take hold from the sudden and deep recession brought on by the novel Now, and again, the lies. Was the recession brought on by the coronavirus or the forced unemployment crisis? Personal income dropped 4.2% in May. The $600 supplement Congress added to weekly unemployment benefits is due to expire July 31st. Without new support, recipients face a substantial loss of income, particularly devastating for those like the Ramirez family who worked in hard-hit sectors like hospitality where new jobs are scarce. During high unemployment and a still raging pandemic, the end of enhanced jobless benefits could drag on consumer spending, set off a wave of missed rent and mortgage payments and translate to a slower recovery. That's a great concern for Rachel Fincham, 55, who lost her job at a national bakes t-shirt printing company after 18 years. She has sought forbearance on her mortgage, but is worried about what will happen when the government programs run out. Benefits lifted spending. If you look at the low income, uh, the scroll ahead to the chart in this one, please, CJ. Lift the spending. Spending by low income households recovered faster after the federal government began distributing stimulus checks in mid April. The expiration of enhanced unemployment benefits on July 31st could hit low income families the hardest. But of course, what this points out is that this is artificial. They're spending more, but they're not producing more. They're not working. They're not creating value. They're what is now a government-created drain on the economy. I don't mean to say, oh, you're a drain on the economy. No, but when you are unemployed and government is paying you to stay unemployed, you don't contribute if you're not. I know this is, this is really oversimplifying things, but you get the point, right? You're the overall effect of this is that 
demand and consumer uh, consumption levels are are going back up, but productivity is staying down. You don't think that's going to have consequences? So to New York, just to show you how they're using the fear and the economic manipulation to create more of a way that people are being controlled, the Daily Mail headline reads, New Yorkers will lose paid sick leave benefits if they travel to states with high COVID-19 infection rates, says Governor Andrew Cuomo. Employed New Yorkers will lose their paid sick leave benefits if they travel to states with high coronavirus infection rates under new executive order. Hey, you know how we're giving this thing, uh, giving you this thing that you need for your health? Well, if something unhealthy might happen to you, we're going to take it away. The order signed by Governor Cuomo applies to employed New Yorkers who voluntarily travel to states with infection rates of 10% or more. How do you determine what state has an infection rate of 10% or more? Do you believe those? Now, does this, is this create, now, again, the snake eating its own tail. Is this creating the incentive now for other states to be able to say, no, it's good, We're, our rates are low, so come New York tourists. Now, which are these states? You want to talk about the ones that we might be driving through to get to Florida? The states impacted, according to the latest COVID-19 data, are Alabama, Arizona, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Nevada, South Carolina, Utah, and Texas. We would be driving through Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Mississippi, and Texas. States that are flagged for increased restrictions. That's where we're going. If we have to drive, like, can we drive to Florida? I don't know. Am I going to lose some benefits? If they, can they, they can do, apparently this is cool for government to do. It's not cool. They're getting away with it. Is there, you know, other consequences that you're going to face because of this? Now, rent is due in just a couple of days here. Get ready. Happy Independence Day, America. July 4th is going to come with a wave of people not being able to pay rent. Yeah, I've heard, yeah, you got to be saved for a rainy day. You got to save up and, and, and be ready for a rainy Well, what about those of us who have and who have been ready? Well, don't worry. Government's going to steal from you and give to people who weren't prepared. And this might be the last chance. Really, everybody now on Earth needs to look at the second half of 2020 and go, this might be my last chance to be prepared, to get prepared. You have time to shift to a lifestyle like ours here at the Garden of Freedom. And live off grid. Be self-sufficient. You can get there, but this might be the last chance. Now, we've covered a lot of positive stories in this as well. And you know me as... America's favorite libertarian civil disobedience activist. I've been hugely encouraged by a lot of this. But there are just too many Karens out there. I don't think this... Oh, Jim, I want you to listen to this next story. You tell me if you think this is going to overcome the weight of the Karens of America. Santa Cruz County lifts beach closures. Quote, people are not willing to be governed from yahoo.com via Los Angeles Times. And this is one of the stories that we got from our producer club super chat. I was very excited to see this one. And I wouldn't have got it anywhere else. This didn't come up in any of my other feeds. I only saw this because one of our patrons sent it to the group there. As California reported back-to-back -back record numbers of coronavirus cases this week among the, amid the continued reopening of the state, Santa Cruz County has decided to fully reopen its beaches 
noting that the restrictions were becoming increasingly difficult to enforce. The county, which has upheld some of the state's strictest shelter-in-place guidelines longer than many other locales in California, will lift all beach closures at midnight, officials said. Until midnight, we'll still arrest people for going to the beach. Now, this is California. California's got enough contradictions. And by the way, pe keeping people in, in prison right now, for those who are elderly or immunocompromised, and that's a lot of them, might be kind of an unnecessary death sentence if you believe the hype. I don't. But you are, and by the way, the government has been treating prisons and jails like they're these sealed things. We've even heard government officials say, well, they're kind of isolated communities, so we don't have to count them in our statistics for positive cases in our county because uh, if we did, we we would we, our rates would be too high and we'd have to shut down more. And it's like, you just don't count those people? People don't count if they're what they're not human beings. Here's the reality. Every single day in America, you have about 200,000 people going into jail and 200,000 people coming out. That's a lot of traffic, plus visitors, employees, all the contractors that work in jails. You are creating Petri dishes where if one inmate gets it, Within a short period of time, every inmate has it. And what are they doing for people who test positive in jail? Are they letting them out? No. Solitary confinement. What does this all lead to with the greatest contradiction we've seen from California recently? They are releasing sex offenders from jail. Convicted, pedophile, rapists, people who should be locked up or physically prevented from interacting with the rest of society are being released while people in California are being arrested for going to the beach. You go paddle boarding, come back to the shore, find yourself getting cuffed and dragged away with cops on either side of you and no social distancing being practiced whatsoever. Cops going out interacting with people are probably some of the greatest carriers in petri dishes for this. So, the current order closed beaches from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. for all activities except walking across the sand to enter the water. So, people could still use the ocean for recreational purposes during that time. Do you, like, wait a second. I, I, I missed this part of the story before. So the beaches are closed except walking across the sand to enter the water. It's kind of this is kind of like prohibiting dancing. You're allowed to walk here, but you can't do anything else. You can't sit. What if the beach is too far? You have to stop and sit down and catch your breath. Well, tough shite, old lady. You can't go to the beach then. Because you have to be able to walk straight across the beach into the water. So, beachgoers were also prohibited from picnicking, sunbathing, sitting or congregating in a stationary setting when the beach was open in the mornings and evenings, typically for walking or running along the shoreline. But residents have continued to ignore the rule. As Santa Cruz's health officer, Dr. Gail Newell, said Thursday, it's become impossible for law enforcement to continue to enforce the closures. People are not willing to be governed anymore in that regard. Of course, they take that out of the headline, right? And see, this is where libertarians get excited. We go, people are not willing to be governed anymore in that regard. The Karens of America are very willing to be governed. The county had intended to keep the beach restrictions in place until after the July 4th weekend, but efforts to enforce the closure have become increasingly more difficult. The county's current order is set to expire July 6th and will not be renewed. That means the county's directives will align with state orders. California remains in the latter portion of stage three of its reopening plan, which is allowed for the reopening of gyms, bars, restaurants, and nail salons 
and most other businesses. Also tattoo parlors. Our friend Mimi Robeson, California State Chair of the Libertarian Party, just got a new tattoo. Congratulations. And uh, condolences to the owners of that tattoo shop. She got the very last tattoo in that shop. Why are they closing down post-corona? The business just isn't viable. How many people kind of like on the edge of getting a tattoo and then went, oh, I have to go and let somebody touch me. Never mind. Because of Corona. The wave of business closures is really just starting to hit. So Santa Cruz County's face covering mandate is still intact, keeping with the new statewide requirement and some other Public health orders connected to facilities like skilled nursing homes will also remain. Children over the age of two will no longer have the option to wear a face covering. However, that will now be a requirement. Children over the age of two. What are you going to do? You have a two, two-year-old running around without a mask on? Well, you better tackle that mother fricker and 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 wrestle them to the ground and put a knee on their neck and handcuff them so that they don't spread the virus. Hmm. As Newell said, this may seem stringent and difficult, but it has proven to be manageable in countries around the world. And of course, they end this with the justification of the deaths. The county of 273,000 has recorded three deaths related to COVID-19. Three out of 273,000. More people have died in that county in car accidents during this time. And this is all they can talk about there. So Jim, I mean, that's it for my big opener. Like I, I, I think that's a pretty good overview of where we are, but where that leaves us now is it's, the Karens of America versus the rest of us. Because the Karens are the ones who make it possible for this line to, to keep stepping up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and keeping things confusing. So, Jim, do you think we're going to win? Or the Karen? I mean, the Karens are winning this round. How do you convert a Karen? You know, Karen, what's, should we look this up in the Urban Dictionary to, to be precise, Whatever right? Find a Karen. Karen, Urban Dictionary, because I don't, I don't want to be imposing my own definition here. So UrbanDictionary.com slash Karen, the stereotypical name associated with rude, obnoxious, and insufferable middle-aged white women. Yep. Now, I, I would go, you know, I, I would be somewhat more expansive in my application here. I don't think you have to be white or a woman to be a Karen. There is certainly a legitimate association with that white woman demographic of being the scared busybodies. Karens take everything wrong with the typical over-entitled Western woman and crank it up by several thousand percent. They are a mutated subspecies that descends from the soccer mom and have many of their traits, such as a short temper, a crown bowl haircut, and a necessarily large SUV to take her kids to soccer practice and be a menace on the road, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But parents have developed their own unique characteristics slash antics as well, including but not limited to reveling in making the life or of retail workers a living hell by constantly making a scene over nothing and demanding to speak to the manager, a near universal battle cry among Karens. I demand to speak to the manager. I really should do that in a female voice, right? I demand to speak to the manager. That's a pretty good Karen voice, right? Get out of my park, you black people barbecuing, or I'm going to call the police. Put on your mask, or I'm going to report you. There, that's a good Karen. I'm we're, Remember that one. I'm Karen, and I care about your health and safety, and that's why I'm calling the police to shut down this party. 
threatening to sue someone for a minor misdemeanor they may or may not have committed and may or may not have even involved Karen at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps the future of the coronaphobia crisis comes down to the Karens of America versus the rest of us. Now, if you've ever been married as a man to a woman, you know that the worst thing you can tell your wife is, calm down. Don't be. So this is a, a major process that we have to go through to beat the Karens with love and patience and compassion. Because that's how you beat fear. Truth, facts, logic, reasoning. Driven by love and patience. And then we can overcome the phenomenon, the rule of the Karens. Now, is it really the Karens who have taken over? No, but they are the ones that government uses as the excuse for all of the evil that it conducts throughout the world in order to keep the Karen safe. Will the Karens, this new subspecies, choose to evolve back into sane human beings? We can hope so. Because I think that's what it comes down to right now in terms of our current crisis. It's the Karens of America versus the rest of us. <laughs>